All right, so we are going to be getting started um, here shortly. I'll give it a few minutes just to get some people um, into the chat before we get started. All right. Um, so, um, welcome everyone um, to the Public House and Learning series. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Jasmine. Um, I'm the community manager at Packer Place, um, which is an entrepreneurial hub in Uptown Charlotte. Um, so, before we jump right into the conversation with Mike today, um, I do want to kind of give a little bit of um, set the stage as to why we decided to pivot these public houses. Um, so if you've ever heard of the quote, proximity breeds care and distance breeds fear, um, I feel like that was really a quote um, that inspired this pivot. Um, I think that it's extremely evident in the society that we witnessed even last year and even what we're still kind of working through um, today that there's really not enough closeness between people that aren't alike, that don't come from different ethnicities or genders or financial backgrounds or whatever the case may be. And I think because of that, there's a huge lack of knowledge and empathy and care amongst each other. Um, and I think also with that, because we don't understand where each other is coming from or because we're not having those conversations, it's hard to understand other people's perspectives. Um, so really the whole point behind this whole series is to just start having those uncomfortable conversations amongst people that are just not like us um, and to start bridging the gaps between our differences. Um, so, um, so I just wanted to quickly say um, this, a right versus wrong. Um, this is not politically driven. This is not to say like your thoughts before um, were incorrect and then ours are correct. This is really just to start having those conversations and start being able to understand each other's different um, perspectives. Um, and then I also just want to quickly note, um, I by no means do I think that I am a great public speaker, but I think really my driving force to moderating this, this new series is to no longer let the fear um, get in the way of learning how to be a better advocate, to learn how to stand and speak up about the things that are important. Um, so obviously, I'm going to be nervous during this, and I think that if any of you kind of share those same sentiments of you know not knowing how to approach a certain situation or um, how to ask a question without fear of offending someone. Um, we share the same sentiment. Um, we're in the same boat. But if you, um, and I, and I want to offer this to everyone, if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat as me and um, Mike start um, the conversation. But if you are still in that boat where you don't know necessarily how to ask the questions um, and you um, may not know how to frame it in a way that you don't want to offend someone, feel free to private chat me. I want to ask the questions for you because I think it's really important that um, we get those questions answered and that you can start understanding and that you can start learning. Um, but I do want to just quickly say that I think each and one of you uh, for coming out today um, for the willingness to want to unlearn um, some of these things and then also to start practicing the relearning of it as well. Um, so without further ado, I do want to um, call Mike to the stage um, quickly. I don't know if Todd Bulo is on, um, but shout out to him for connecting me with Mike. Um, he has been an amazing mentor, a great speaker. Um, he's connected me with a few folks, Lo Myrick, Sydney. Um, so thank you, Todd. Uh, thank you, Mike, for being here. Um, so before we get into the conversation that we have tonight, um, I figured it would be kind of fun to just start off with some icebreaker questions, if you're ready for that. Always. Love yeah. yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, so to start, uh, what is your most used emoji? The uh, Either the heart or the, uh, the fist pump. Okay. I, I, at least 50 times a day on both of them. Okay, yeah. perfect. Um, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? I would be able to speak any language. Cool. Um, I, what I feel like that's like to be able to go anywhere and talk to people. I feel like that would be, I don't know. I, I mean, sure, flying would be great too, but 
I don't know. I think being able to communicate would be awesome. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then what is a trait or habit that you inherited or learned from one or both of your parents? Uh, I would say my dad is very like, calm. Like he's very measured and you're just, you just don't really see him get worked up about a whole lot. And I still have some work to go there, but I think more than anything, I've, I've taken that from him. Just, you know, like there's, there's so many, um, <clears throat> I'm just diving into talking about leadership. Right now, but, <laughs> Hold yeah. off, Mike. Okay. Hold all right. I'll, I'll fall. All right. Yeah. But, but anyway, just, you know, managing your emotions is so important in, as leaders. And so I think I learned that from him and it's, I've, it's a pretty yeah. good question. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then we'll end with this one. If you, this, this one's my fun, this was the funniest. Um, if you were a refrigerator, what item would you hate holding? Pizza. Pizza. Why? It should either be eaten hot and fresh mm -hmm. or my college experience has told me that it tastes just as great on the countertop the next day. And so it's, it would just be taking up unnecessary space in the refrigerator. Yeah. And I lied. I'm actually going to ask you one more question because I'm, I'm really curious to hear what, what it is. Um, what is one place that you never, ever want to go? Never like, a, like a country that I, I never want to go. I mean, Hey, a, a country, a restaurant. Um, I okay. don't know. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, I, I'm 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 infatuated with Asian food and and the culture and all like I really want to go to Japan at some point one day. But if I never make it to China, I don't know why. I mean, the Great Wall, I mean, they have so much there, but I don't know. I just people had talked about going there all the time and I'm just like, "Yeah. I don't know why that is. I don't know." Hey, uh, not to not to um, you know put you on the spot here, but Desmond Wiggins, I see you're in the audience. Um, he actually um, was studying in China for a little while, so I mean, I'm sure he could do a little bit of convincing to uh, sure get you to China. I'm sure it's great. I'm sure it's great. I just for whatever reason, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> seems like a well, long flight. If I'm going to go that far, I'd rather go to Japan or Australia. I don't know. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I don't know about you guys at home, um, but I definitely feel like I know Mike just even a little bit more just from hearing his answers to the question. Um, and, and the reason that we kind of started with these icebreaker questions is I think it's really important to get to know Mike or to get to know an individual about, you know, the things that they like, what they don't like, what they're passionate about, uh, you know, what their biggest fears are rather than just, you know, Mike, where do you work? What's your title? Um, so now that we know Mike as a as a person, um, you know, as a as a refrigerator, he wouldn't want to have a pizza in it. Like now that we know that, um, now let's jump right into um, you know today's topic of, of unlearning leadership. Um, so start us off, Mike. Tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what you're currently up to. Um, yeah, take it away. Mike Metcalf, uh, oldest of four, grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, right here. Um, I have been in the NASCAR, like motorsports industry for 16 years. I was a student athlete at Appalachian State, played football, been in sports my whole life, um, had uh, some injuries and was hoping to play football, but the, just didn't work out that way. And uh, opportunities uh, that I, I'm very grateful and thank God every day that opportunity to, to be on a pit crew uh, opened up. I uh, started as a developmental pit crew person uh, in, the, in a parts room half of the day and then training to be on a pit crew for the other half of the day. Uh, that went from being a full-time pit crew athlete to uh, being a mechanic slash full-time pit crew athlete to being a pit crew athlete and coaching and training other pit crew athletes to now overseeing uh, the pit crew department with Sean Pete at Chip Ganassi Racing, which is a global motorsports um, organization. And I would say about four years ago now, which kind of sounds crazy because it feels like I just did my first speaking gig yesterday, uh, but it, uh, it was about four years ago. Uh, at uh, in Indianapolis for the NFL Combine, threw a message together. Um, that message was kind of the 
building block for what became deck leadership and a book 12 second culture that released last year last year was a very tumultuous year racially socially politically any you just add ly to it and it, it was it was probably <laughs> probably challenging and uh, our book just has a, a really good theme i think of diversity and so since then um we've done some major dni trainings uh including nascar preseason uh we trained over 1800 people through just unlearning the diversity and 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 what uh opportunities can exist if we kind of rally around maybe a, a more wholesome or just better concept and uh so a lot of diversity training working with culture development with some uh, pharmaceutical companies amerisource bergen and otska and then um got two little kids three and one and a wife that i uh, try to spend as much time with as i can so uh Life's happening right now. We're busy. It's fun. They're all things I asked for, so I'm, I'm not complaining about being busy. Um, and it and there's just a lot of work to be done when it comes to leadership. You know, thinking about the majority of heart attacks happening on Monday mornings in the U.S. pre pre COVID when people were going in the office and sitting in traffic. Most heart attacks were on Monday morning. Um, Two thirds of people would say they don't um, just they're not feeling the work they're doing. To just like they, it's like yeah, it, it pays the bills, but I would rather be doing this. You also have people that I think it was sixty percent of people said they would trust a complete stranger over their boss, right? So I mean, we have some problems <laughs> yeah. when it comes to our co corporate ecosystems, and I think our definitions of leadership, of serving, of diversity. I think if we could kind of reframe and shift our mindsets a little bit, maybe we could move forward at a at a faster pace. Yeah. So I, I kind of want to back up a little bit and, and, you know, get into more of your experiences um, in the specific industry that you're in, because it. I, I know NASCAR has been like pretty predominantly white male base. Um, so let's let's talk about that. Like, how do you feel like your experience as a black man in a predominantly white industry? How has that been for you? Do you feel like you have experienced um, racism and, and have you experienced it from someone in a leadership position? Is that kind of what inspired the, the deck leadership? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely white male dominated. Um, and, and that's it's tied into major manufacturing um, proximity being mainly southern sport um, you, you look at the ownership group and the resources that it, it requires to be able to race it just wasn't in the in the cards for minorities and you know women to be drivers things like that um, it's it's evolving you know I would say, even when Sean and I got to Chip Ganassi racing, the entire, I mean, we inherited a, an, a, an entire department full of white dudes. <laughs> and um, I would say it was probably, I was probably 10 years in before I worked with another, like, minority, you know, it, in, in you know in my everyday job and so but in the last few years it's just changed significantly which is i think a sign of, of progress um the team that we now lead is the most like culturally racially diverse we have a female tire changer um so in a short span it's it's gone a long way but it was you know i just tried to and, and work very hard to understand what implicit biases are and how they work and and i learned a lot of them just based upon conversations people would have with me mm -hmm. you know hey you know if you want to you know they say you know if you want to um uh hide something from a black guy put it under his work boots um you know going up to see our hr director and see the team president poke his head out and say hey we don't need drugs up here um just, like just you would hear you know something would get missing and <laughs> somebody would go to Sean and say, hey, we got the guy that stole it. Look on the camera. Look at the how heavy the backpack is that the new guy's walking out with. And it was me leaving with my backpack. Um, and, and so, you know, you learn to think about, OK, what are the, some of the biases? You know, laziness, thief, uh, drugs. You know, so, so it's like, all right, well, then if 
these people don't know me and they think these kinds of things, what are the things that I think about other people, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Like what, what has been told and dictated to me? What have I learned? Because, you know, we hear all the time, more is taught than caught in life, right? Like you're just gonna catch stuff from family, media, uh, the sports leagues that you play, the church or community groups or, you know, different, you know, the girl next door, the, you know, all these things you just are assuming and amassing so much that you don't even know. You may talk all the time about, you know, if when's the last time you bought a car and, you know, once you decided on a make and model and when the split second you get in that and drive it off the lot, you start seeing that same car everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's just a car buying experience. That's just you making one decision on like, I like that car. What do you think happens when you see commercials and movies and read books and see them and watch the news you know, which I'm not sure why people still watch the news, but um, it's the same thing is happening, right? Like your mind is being overloaded with stuff and you can't even process it, but it is getting in there. And so it is up to us as leaders um, to work to uncover what's in there and unpack that in a healthy way and then try to use those things once we learn and teach ourselves the proper ways to uh, address people of different cultures, um, the proper ways to have conversations. Um, I don't know if that paints the picture at all, but I, I think it's important. It's an important job, and it's a responsibility of all for all of us. Yeah, um, I mean, for those at at home that may not know what an implicit or an unconscious bias is, um, in your own words, like how would you describe what that is? And and not to put you on the spot, but I mean, I'm interested to hear like what kind of implicit biases that it, do you feel like you have had that you feel like you have had to unlearn? Let's uh. Um, I've never done this before, but let's, let's real quick story. Um, so say, um, a friend of yours is, uh, coming home from, I don't know, working internationally gets to, gets to the airport and you, uh, I don't know, just, uh, pick her up. Um, and while you're waiting a, a large, like a, let's say it's a, a Dodge Challenger with 22 inch wheels and rap music just goes blaring by and parks right next to you. So it's kind of loud while you're waiting. Anyway, she gets in, hops in, you guys, you know, you go grab some coffee from a local, like kind of artsy coffee shop. Um, you get, um, to your table and you overhear a conversation about um, somebody's lawn care guy um, that they were having a hard time with. Um, you go home and um, you guys, you know, hear that somebody broke into like your next door neighbor's house. Um, if I were to just say like, all right, the Dodge Challenger that parked next to you with the loud music and the 22 inch wheels, if you just had to guess what race or ethnicity would you just assume that that person was? I would assume he was a black man. Okay. Um, barista at an artsy coffee shop. What? That was a lot harder. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, but you see, I'm oh, a white dude. Art. He would be a white guy, right? Probably. Probably. Yeah, I mean, yeah I'm, a I'm, white I'm, guy at an artsy. He's a barista. Yeah, he's a white guy. Barista. Yeah. Okay. Um, you sit down and uh, somebody, this person looks somewhat wealthy that's driving a coffee, uh, is complaining about their lawn care person. Who who would be complaining about a, a lawn care person? A white guy? A white? What, who, who would the, what, where, what ethnicity would the lawn care person be probably most likely? Oh, Mike, probably a black man. Or I mean, maybe maybe Latino or Hispanic. Like yeah. Okay. Or, or, okay. Right. Okay. So I, I love I, I just... and I will say I love the people that are like in, like participating in the chat as well. Like, feel free to participate in the chat. Like, play along with this as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just you know it's implicit biases are just stereotypes that we've just accepted as commonalities yeah. and and factual. Yep. Yeah. I think would be the easiest way to say it. it's just you know uh things that we've seen so much of we just kind of assume that all of this group acts this way and i think the danger to that is is that 
um, you know, often that's wrong. And often we miss opportunities to, to put people in places that they where maybe they could crush it just, but we're not thinking about them for that position or, um, you know, it catches us off guard and we don't engage. Yeah. Do you feel like, or, or maybe not, do you feel like, but with these implicit biases, like what do you think is the most harmful? And, and before we get to people in leadership, I think it's really important to kind of start at, at kind of like, you know, an average person like me. Um, what is the harm with keeping these implicit biases? Yeah, I think the the danger is is that it's it's just damaging to the people who the biases affect, yeah. right? Um, and you're putting, you know, I think it's Mary Brown that says that preconceived notions are locks on the doors of wisdom. When we come into our conversations with uh, employees, our workforces, when we already go into it with assumptions. Now, there's a difference between being prepared, right? Like you have to come into conversation with prepared to bring something. Yeah. But when we come in with our notions preconceived of how it should go or what I should expect, um, we limit the capacity to, to, to move our, move the needle, to make our team stronger, to be faster, to be more efficient, to be better, to be kinder. Mm -hmm. How do you feel like these implicit biases are especially harmful for people in these like HR roles or people in these executive positions? How do we think that these implicit biases are, are shaping the way that um, these executives or these HR hiring folk, how is it shaping their, um, like their decision, their decisions to hire people into their company? Do you, do you know who um, Austin Channing Brown is? Mm -hmm. If you had to guess who Austin, like Austin Brown, what kind of, is that male, female? Yeah, sure. Yeah, male, male for sure, Austin Brown. Okay. So Austin Channing Brown is a, is a black woman who wrote a book called I Am, I Am Here. Yeah. And in it, she explains that her parents named her that so that she could pass resume tests. Wow. And, you know, that is a, generally a very sweet and tender moment when you name name your child um and, and and a lot of people probably would never think that what i write on this paper could profoundly impact my child's life right like you should just be thinking about I me mean, i just want to name them you know whatever family traditions or a name i like but um i think that kind of talks to that story of when we look at certain names, we kind of automatically jump to certain things. Uh, I see people saying, yeah, incredible book. It's awesome. And had a friend that did the same thing. Um, and, and even with the chats, just with this story, I just made that up. So it wasn't very well thought out, but people saying like, oh, the, the bad driver was probably a woman or an Asian. It's like, but exact, but that's exactly what I'm saying. It's like, we all, we all have these things yeah. where we just think a certain way. And, and, and it's, 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 um, again, up to us to try to unlearn these things. Yeah, completely. Um, there's like one question that I'm like dying to hear um, kind of your perspective on. Um, so in, and I'm gonna read it off my phone. So um, uh, in the light of the racial justice movement, um, we all saw last year, um, it made a lot of corporations think a lot heavier about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but also understanding that a lot of people still have these implicit and unconscious biases that they're not addressing. Um, so now that they are, you know, when these companies were starting to think, okay, well, now I have to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, you know, a lot of these corporations started to come out and, um, you know, were releasing different initiatives or were, you know, having a banner on their website with, you know, Black Lives Matters and all of that, like all of these initiatives, I won't say that it's not a positive thing, but I think if it's done in a genuine way, right, it can be very impactful. It can be, yes, us as a company, we want to be better with diversity and inclusion. We want to know how we can be a better team, a better corporation, right? But what happens when you have the other executives that are just trying to meet this quota, 
um, of diversity and inclusion. So they per, they are perceived as diverse and inclusive. And I, this is like a loaded question. So if I need to re, like respond it let, or um, to repeat it, let me know. Um, but how do you think that we can spot the differences between these leaders and these large corporations making these decisions for DNI initiatives from them being purely gen, uh, genuine about it versus the people that are just trying to meet this quota? Yeah, um, I think that's easy. At only time will tell. Uh, there, I was talking to the senior vice president of NASCAR a couple of days ago, and he was like, "You know, how do how is anyone going to know NASCAR is serious about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah. We won't know for twenty years, you know. But there, we talk all the time about the the aggregate of marginal gains in our in our racing world where we're trying to save tenths of seconds, or we're trying to just make incremental improvements. And, and the important thing to do there is just to, to be steady and consistent over time. Um, I think it was, I think it's NASDAQ or the Dow, one of them was, is looking into requiring, in order to be listed, to be publicly traded, mm -hmm. you have to have there's a certain matrix they're looking at, you know, X number of women, X number of um, different, you know, ethnicities, things like that. And, and I like that, but I think that when you do these types of things, you force actors, you just, yep. you just comply and, and compliance isn't what's going to move the needle, uh, in conversations like yeah. this. Um, it's action and, and, and being proactive, not being reactionary. And then, you know, a lot of times, you know, what you're going to start to see probably in six months from now is, is people are going to do this because it looks right and you're going to elevate somebody into a position that may they may not be qualified to be in, but they just may be the senior most female at the organization or the senior most, you know, minority. Mm -hmm. And when stockholders come back and say, hey, what's going on? Why are we underperforming or we didn't meet expectations? who's going to be the first person to get blamed, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Probably the, probably the woman that they just put on the board. We're like, well, you know, if it wasn't for her, we'd probably be, you know, mm -hmm. and so I'm just, I'm, I've been, I've been very cautious when, when talking to people like, Hey, let's, let's groom people over time. Yeah. Let's start small. Okay. Let's just be able to have uncomfortable conversations and, 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 and be problem focused instead of people focused. Um, let's, um, Try, you know, and I think that's the the route that that people need to go. You know, how to tell if someone's making a difference? You're only going to know um, if they're still trying to make a difference five years from now, ten years from now. There's a lot of performative activism, which is being emotionally mm -hmm. uh, tied into something, mm -hmm. um, and and that's okay. But if it doesn't develop into strategy, um, into infrastructure, into hiring, you know rewriting the hiring code, rewriting what the standards and expectations are for the company. You know, these are the things that are actually going to help move the needle over time. Yeah. You said something that I and I've really been thinking about lately is problem focused versus people focused, right? I think in the society that we're living in now, the the polarization of these two different groups, whether it's political, whether it's racial, gender based, money based, whatever it may be, People are so like, and this is not to foreshadow it, but like we'll talk about fear in another episode. But, you know, I, I think everyone is super hyper focused on the person currently. They're, they're you know, people want to make enemies. People don't want to solve problems. Um, and and for me, you know, I, I, you know, being in the younger generation, being in Gen Z, I, I will like admit that I probably was part of it at one point, but I think like once you start trying to unlearn that it's not the person that we're after, right? We're, we're, we're not, I don't want to make enemies with people just because they have a different opinion than I do. I want to mm -hmm. learn how we can go about solving this problem, how 
both of our differences, how we can bring those together. And we may not like understand each other and we may not like be able to um, come to an agreement, but at least we can both say at the end of the day, we can respect each other's differences rather than making enemies right off the bat, rather than even trying to fix the problem. So what you said, I think was extremely, um, I, I mean, I think that was powerful. And then, you know, to the point at, to, we got to groom people over time, unpack that. What do you, what do you mean as far as um, um, grooming people over time to start having this more like diverse um, and inclusive mindset? Most, most diversity officers do not have they have the position of being a chief diversity mm -hmm. officer, but don't have the resources or budget or team beneath them. Um, they're holding a seat at the table so that they can, you know, when everybody signs off on a, a, a merger or you know, whatever, they can say, hey, are, are we are we good on the, is this diversity compliant? Okay, cool. You know, and, and they get to chime in in that moment, yeah. but as far as actually really impacting the organization, um, a lot of the people that I talk to are, are still just like, I'm still waiting on my budget and it's been a year or two. Yeah. Um, I need more people to really do this um, because finance has a team and marketing has a team and sales has a team, but it's like they've got four people for a massive organization, right? And so I think it's um, getting people in the door that are talented that have studied studied bias, that have studied discrimination, that have studied maybe even something completely different than diversity or the company, period. Just bringing new eyes to the table of like, okay, how can we bring some type of reconciliation and togetherness and equality and unity to our organization? Because stats are showing that the, the um, who just won the Super Bowl? The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have the most Gen, the most females and most minorities of any coaching staff in the NFL. Right behind them is the Chiefs, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> That's her showing that diverse work, like truly diverse workforces are 18% more proficient in efficiency and performance. Yeah. And so when, when I talk about these kind of things, it's not just so that more people that look like me can get jobs. No, no, no. I want to make companies better, right. right? I want my company to be better. So that's why I'm passionate about it because I've seen it pick our team from being average to being excellent. Right. Um, so now I kind of want to like pivot into this whole leadership concept. Um, to start, do you feel like there is a stereotypical um, idea of what, someone in a leader position a leadership position looks like maybe not like maybe not like um you know the mental attributes that they have about it themselves but maybe the physical attributes do you feel like there is a preconceived idea of what a leader looks like yeah i mean i think it's like brad pitt right like <laughs> tall handsome charismatic can command the room uh, smart, good looking, you know, athletic, you know, went to Harvard, you know, like, right, right. Like there's this whole thing. And um, for us, I would say, you know, when you talk about, and I think I may have touched on this a little bit last time, but what's the word C stand for in, in CEO? Chief. Yeah. Chief. Right. And, and, and do you know how one became a chief in tribal times or okay they they were the they were the leaders in protecting and empowering their tribe that was it that's all you had to do to be a chief and it was serving right it was giving of your time and talents and resources to empower and improve the lives of those around you and and most chiefs today unfortunately don't yeah. do that right and so so how do you get to be a chief now? It's it's a uh, profound <laughs> lack of empathy <laughs> to where you can just make a lot of, you know, unattached, uh, unemotional choices that affect a lot of processes and a lot of people. Just being able to look at data and be able to crunch it um, efficiently, right? And and it's and I think what twenty twenty has done is is moved people back to being purpose over purse strings. You know, a lot of people are saying, you know what. 
I'll take a job where I make a lot less to do something that I feel connected to, right? The self-determination theory, connected to others, good at what you do and authentic in what you, in who you are, right? A really good process isn't gonna do that for human beings, but something that you feel connected to, absolutely, that starts to check some boxes. And so I think that we, um, you know, we just need to revisit like what, what does it mean to be a leader? You know, is that the company car and the window office? And, it, you know, is it just the escalation of ourselves or is it helping push other people up the ladder? Because the chiefs of old would say it's pushing other people up the ladder. Yeah, to that point, um, and not to be corny, um, because, you know, my boss was on the call, but um, I just recently finished uh, the seven habits training with Dan. And um, what he was explaining to me or to everyone really was, um, and I'm not going to like say this correctly. So forgive me, Dan. Um, but you have the dependence, you have independence, and then you have the interdependence, right? So independence is where you're all about like, look what I can do. I'm independent. I got this. Like I'm all about me, um, you know, and, and I feel like that's kind of like coinciding with what this leadership position is now is like, look at me, look what I can do for this team. Look what I can do for this company. Look at me with my car and all of that stuff. But I think what you're saying is at the top, um, the top tier of it, which is the inter interdependence of it. And how can we lift people up? How can we work as a team to thrive rather than it just being a me thing? Um, so that was just kind of like a random correlation that I had um, with, you know, the, the, the independence and the interdependence and kind of like how leaders now um, I feel like are in the dependent phase still, um, you know, very much about themselves and how and, and this is, you know, a question to you. How do you think that we can start um, and maybe this is not something that we can do but maybe this is something that the leaders would have to fix within themselves but how do you think we can get the leaders to the place of interdependence on how do we work as a team how do we work as a collective um to raise yeah <laughs> well i would say the the easy strategy is is that leaders need to be more focused on giving than getting mm -hmm. right um the stimulus I, I was looking at something the other day and it was saying that the stimulus is not like stimulus checks aren't working because people are using them for to pay off debt or saving mm -hmm. and the whole point of it is is get the money and then spend it so that it provides a boost to the economy yeah. right and it's it's no different than it's what leaders are supposed yeah. to do right like we're supposed to stimulate those around us and provide a boost for them. Um, I, I wrote a couple of things down, right? So that you can bring your whole self to work each day um, so that your career can, can grow, so that you can be challenged in the work that you're doing, right? And we all as leaders have an ecosystem or, or an environment that we have to pour into, that we have to bring sunlight and nutrients to. And if, if we are more worried about us getting the sunlight and us getting the water and the rain and all that, then we, we limit the opportunity for those on our team to help push us, push us forward. Right. And, and I think, you know, leaders we've, we've done a, you know, and I, and I, and I have to check myself and I haven't done it all right, but I know I've been, you know, sometimes it's like, man, why, why aren't we moving forward? And, I have to look in the mirror and it's like, it's me. I'm hamstringing our organization <laughs> because I'm so focused on, you know, I'm getting too much attention right now, you know, I, and I, and I have to check myself on that. And that's what Sean and I, you know, we're very passionate about that. And that, and that is very different from self care. Yeah. Cause I think honestly, that's where a lot of leadership breaks down. Uh, I talk all the time about, uh, let's see, Christy and Clint, you know, they've heard me go on rants about this, but you know, there's a reason why they say, uh, in case of emergency, secure your own mask before helping mm -hmm. others, right? Um, if you are not in a, a whole and healthy and healed and egoless and humble position yourself as a leader, there is no way that you will be able to dictate or share that with anybody else. So when we talk about giving to those, it's important for us to do the hard work. It's important for us to 
to have those tough conversations with people in our past who we need to forgive. Yeah. You know, if, if there's estranged relationships with parents, you may never work anything out, but it is important for you to reach out and just say, hey, look, I'm trying. Right. That's OK. It's OK to do that. Um, we talk I talk all the time about, you know, like I think it's Zig Ziglar. If a flower is broken, you don't fix the flower, you fix the environment the flower is in. Right. So many of us that feel disconnected to our work, if we got into a different environment, you know, sometimes you see. It's like, man, I man, I really love this job. It, it might not be that it's the job. It just may be the environment. And so um, fostering an environment where people can learn and grow, I think, is, is really, really important. And but it starts with you. It starts with you investing in yourself, pouring into yourself. Um, yoga, reading, getting quiet, getting away taking time to think so many of us are so busy working on our job that we, excuse me, in our job that we never work on it. You know, we never, we're just, we're just clicking through emails and just trying to do onto the next thing and task and task and task and task and task oriented to where we forget to like step back a little bit. How can I improve this job title? Right. And, and I think those are some of the ways that, you know, we can, start to change. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, ego. Um, and, and I feel like a lot of people struggle with their own ego um, and letting that get in the way of things. How do you think that leaders especially can start stripping themselves um, of that ego in order to, to, to start being more progressive in the right way? I think it was the CEO of LinkedIn just came out talking about I can find coders anywhere, but I need people with soft yeah. skills. I sat in a on a board table two years ago with a guy who uh, was a leadership guy, and he but he was all hard hard skills, hard metrics, data data driven, very analytical, and we were thinking about kind of working together and some stuff. And so when he did his spiel, we Sean and I kind of talked about what Deck was about and going to be about, and he was like nobody's ever going to go for any of this. You know, you, you're just the soft skills like that doesn't matter because you can't measure it. And that was the end of the meeting. And it, it kind of, you know, it, we kind of didn't really know what to do with that. <laughs> you know, like, well, this is what I'm really passionate about. And fortunately, we didn't listen and we kept going and, and things are going well for us. But, you know, I think move, moving forward, I think emphasis on, you know, you can like these need to be things that we talk about regularly, you know, and, and this is why this is so yeah. cool. We need training on this kind of thing because we don't get it. We get all the hard stuff, accounting and coding and the list goes on, sales, marketing, but, you know, talk all the time, like titles are for books. I mean, who cares if you get, have PhD and MD and all that at the end of your name, you know, at the end of your life, if you can't also put kind, mm -hmm. hardworking, trustworthy, patient. Like I would rather be known by those things. And, and I think that's what leadership is about. So we need to flip what the importance is. It's not that you're a PhD. That's important. <laughs> it takes, it's, I mean, I don't want, I don't want to, you know, throw education under the bus. That's not what yeah. I'm saying, but I am advocating for us to say that that should be secondary to, to what our, you know, intrinsic titles. Are. Completely. Um, I did see that one question came in through uh, the chat from Clinton. Um, he said, uh, thank you for the work you're doing, McCaff. What would we, society, organizations, employees, employers, gain by being more diverse and inclusive? So, great question. Uh, hey, Clint. You gain uh, purpose and perspective are the two things that I've found. And, and those things are, <clears throat> I would say building blocks to love and hope, which are, in my humble opinion, the strongest forces on this planet. You know, there are so many things that can be overpowered and overconquered by love and, and hope's no different. You know, you think often of a somebody in a sci-fi movie that's left on some des deserted planet and then 
a ship's coming by and they think they're going to die. But then just seeing the ship, it's like, oh, man, new life. Like there now there's hope and, and no one's rescued them. They don't know if they're going to stop. It might be somebody trying to hurt them, you know, but that, but in that moment, there's hope and hope is what fuels us. Right. And so um, if we can bring more diverse perspectives, if we can get out of maybe our own kind of line of what we think should happen. But, you know, it, one of the things that I think is important is that you know, no one you talked to. I think you said it something about like everyone's taking sides. We need people to take stands. Leaders yeah. take stands. But here, this is where I'm at. Right. And you're entitled to take whatever stands you want. What you're not entitled to do is make everyone else's life a battleground because of yep. your beliefs, right? And it's and it's and it's one thing to live by your beliefs. It's another thing to live by your values. Yep. A lot of us are so closely tied to what we believe that we make it a battleground for other people. What Clint is asking about is is shifting to being kind of value mm -hmm. driven, taking stands. <clears throat> being open to other people's ideas and thoughts and opinions and then working together right unity unified groups are always more efficient Uni unity and, and trust are the biggest components to fast pit crews and you would think it's you know recruiting and physical prowess and ability it's just people's ability to work together and and the trust that they have in, in one another so when one job is supposed to happen they fully trust that it's going to happen and they react and, and respond in a way uh, that saves us time. And so um, hopefully that answers yeah. Clint's question. Um, so just, um, well, actually, I just noticed that we're um, at like the 15 minute marker. So I do want to open it up quickly. Um, if anyone does have any questions um, in the audience, feel free to either, um, you know, put them in the chat and then, you know, I'll ask Mike, um, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, but I mean, to the point of, because I kind of want to get more into that polarization and, and how we can kind of avoid um, at that and, and to the point of, um, you know, people are so stuck on their beliefs um, rather than their values. I mean, I I don't know if I'm like the the youngest one in, in the chat, but I or on the group. But um, you know, I feel like my generation is probably some of the most guilty people of this problem of valuing their beliefs. And then if you don't coincide with their beliefs, you don't agree with them. Like you're canceled. Like we don't have. You. So how, what, what advice do you have to people that are still in that mindset of if we don't agree mentally, politically, whatever the case may be, we are not going to be able to come to a, to a understanding. Like how can people start having that conversation with someone that's different, um, you know, without, without it being like a wrong versus right. How can you come to that middle ground of just mutual respect of both opinions? Yeah, it's um, it's something that's not going to just happen. Uh, you have to be intentional about it. But there, there is a way of conversating uh, in which you get to navigate these kind of things comfortably. You know, asking, say, hey, I want to have an uncomfortable conversation with you whenever you have time. And OK, when you do have time, hey, I want to ask these kind of questions i know that they may be triggering i know that you and this is with somebody that you know like it's you're you're gonna have to take the time to try to seek out somebody that you are pretty confident is fundamentally opposed <laughs> from mm -hmm. where you are <clears throat> i want to talk about these questions and and i just want you to answer and i just want to listen i don't want to ask you so that i can then tell mm -hmm. you what i think I just want to listen and I just want to hear you. And if there's ever a point where it's just hard for you to talk about, then we can stop it and I won't force it anymore. Yeah. Right. And it, that just takes so much of that, like, uh, out of it. Right. You know, just like if you approach somebody, they're like, huh, okay, well, I just get to speak my piece and, and that's it. Like people generally will take you up on that. And, and then, Oh, is that it? Yeah, I just I just wanted to listen because I just want I know you had a different experience than me and I just mm -hmm. wanted to hear it. They're all every time. Well, well, tell me, well, tell me, what do you think? You know, when we can get people that are fundamentally opposed on ideas and thoughts 
to come and have common mm -hmm. conversations, that magic happens. Absolutely. Yeah, magic happens. that's awesome. Have a conversation with Grace, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I found some Q&A questions. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see people are using um, the uh, Q&A um, little bit on this side here. Um, so Jordan um, asks a question. Oops. Um, so Jordan asked a question, where did it go? Um, okay, how would you recommend handling a conversation where the other person tries to use statistics to confirm a bias against a group of people? Mm. <laughs> um, there's, <laughs> I just started it. There's a great book that's called Everybody mm -hmm. Lies and um, maybe check that out. But it is literally saying how the algorithms and stats, how they're compiled nowadays, and they are built to, they're built with an end uh, theme in mind, right? So I wanna say that, you know, teenagers do this, or that Asians do this, or that LGBTQ members do this right and it and so then they go back and start to build the stats and it's just what algorithms can do and so i i don't really pay much attention to stats i, I know that's not really mm -hmm. a helpful thing um what i always encourage people do to do is move the stats over for a second and just say talk to me now <laughs> like what what do you believe what are your personal experiences like <clears throat> and how can we have this conversation, just the two of us, independent of the stats? Because at this moment, I don't know the thousand people that got polled for these questions, but I'm talking to you and I really want to connect with you and learn more about you, what you think and what you believe, because that's going to help me now, not not these, not this report. And so um, I think it's always important to try to make some kind of personal kind of thing. Um, a great quote I saw yesterday is just that your... Um, what I wrote it down, uh, business relationships that are personal relationships, um, accelerate outcomes faster. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about speed being the currency of business, all of us are in some type of business. If it's not big beating small, it's just fast beating slow. Right. And so if we can be quick, if we can be efficient, if we can have speed in what we do, uh, if we can just go right to the conversation as opposed to dance. I mean, how many of you have been in meetings where it was an hour and it could have been 10 minutes? Yeah. Right? Just get to it. Just let, Send it in an email we're, next we're time. Right yeah, sure. That, that's another <laughs> conversation. But, I mean, it is important to talk and have dialogue. But, like, let's just get to it. Let's be kind in how we phrase it. Let's be intentional saying like, hey, I just want to listen. I just want to learn. And that's OK. You don't always have to contribute to something. Um, sometimes just listening to others is one of the best things that we can do as leaders. You know, there's a proverb that says the shepherd knows the faces of the mm -hmm. sheep. <clears throat> and to know the face of the sheep, you have to be close to the sheep. Right. There's a proximity piece to that. And, and it's going back to that personal thing, what I'm talking about, like. Stats are great and reports and, and news. And but yeah, but like, let's me and you make some progress here just in our personal relationship because that'll fuel our business relationship. That'll fuel our outcomes. Uh, and that's what we want at the end yeah. of the day. Right. Um, so I think we may have time for two more questions. Um, so um, Mike, what was your proudest moment when you changed, changed some of by, or no, I'm sorry. Let me read that again. <laughs> Mike, what was your proudest moment when you changed some of biases in your professional life? My professional life, proudest moments for me. Um, hmm, that is a great question. Um, I think it's the overall feeling of I, when I see myself, I see it as a like if I was a structure, I would be a bridge, and I and I always want to bring the bridge to work, to home, to this conversation, just. An, an avenue or pathway for people to connect thoughts or ideas that maybe that wouldn't exist naturally. And so um, just different communities, different people um, that I just maybe I'm like, it's not really my deal or jam or thing, but I'm going to do it anyway, just because 
what the heck, you know, <laughs> and then you end up with having some of your best friends and best memories, uh, places that I never would have mm -hmm. thought to travel. Um, working with groups that I'm like, I don't really feel passionate about this mission, but um, mm -hmm. why not? And uh, Todd Bulow roped me into this Charlotte rescue mission. <laughs> I wasn't, I was like, oh, I don't, what is that? I don't really want to. And, but I ended up being on the board there for like six years. And so, um, I mean, that's an easy example. Um, once I kind of found out what they did and kind of unpacked like what their mission was, it was like, this is really cool. And I never knew that I, I, I if I, you, you, I didn't have a, a passion for, to see people that were, to help people mm -hmm. going through recovery. I just was like, oh, they, they need to figure it out. You know, stop doing drugs, right? Like make better choices, but learning about it, you know, I now have a passion for it. And so, um, but that all comes from just this whole concept of diversity of just opening our minds and our thoughts and our experiences. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. and also thank you for uh, introducing me to that yesterday. Um, just the Charlotte, um, is it Charlotte Matter? Or no, the Community Matters Cafe. It was amazing. <laughs> Um, yeah. just being able yeah. to learn about yeah. it. So thank you. Um, and then just one question quickly. Um, I do need a little bit of time at the end just to, um, you know, close us off, but quickly on this, uh, answer, uh, what's the abusability of the diversity and inclusion efforts by large corporations example, building spaces where we can talk about black lives matter and being asked to respect Confederate themes and values. Hold on, one more time. I'm sorry. I was trying to find it in the chat. Um, it's in the Q and A sorry, um, little section. Um, so, uh, what's the abusability of the diversity and inclusion efforts by large large corporations? Examples: building spaces where we can talk about Black Lives Matter and being asked to respect Confederate themes and values. Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, one of the the interesting things about this is, is um, <laughs> like, you know, the, the, the margins of seeing diversity done well for companies is higher, right? And so some people are only doing this because there's dollar signs attached to it, not having, like, there really is a high ROI on it, right? Like, you don't have to actually build out a full staff, you can do a couple of initiatives and bring some different eyes to the table that can help you kind of give you a boost um, without that will make your bottom line better without you having to actually really go in and help infrastructure and empower communities or serve communities that you've not engaged with or you know hire outside of your typical maybe monolithic practices um i, I think again it's a it's a thing it's a time thing and i think it's an accountability thing i think it's important for people that have access to those organizations whether you're uh, have stock in them or know somebody connected to them um to call it out when you see it <laughs> you know um you know it, it Again, you can't make it a battleground. It's not about a battleground. It's about unity and it's about equality, right? And these are things that we all want. Golden rule, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated, right? That's what this is about. Trying to force agendas is not helpful in any stretch, right? And so, um, yeah, I, th I think it's important just to have accountability and speak it. Whenever you see it, tweet about it, harass people. Let them know like, hey, this is not what this is about. This isn't about equality. This is about an agenda. Like. Let's stay focused on what yeah. the real issue is. That's awesome. I wish we had more time to chat, Mike, because I really thoroughly enjoy talking to you. And I'm sure a lot of people at home are like super, um, you know, interested in all of the things you have to say as well. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, way to set the stage really for this unlearning series. Um, so just for the folks, um, you know, with us still, uh, we are going to be having them every month.
Um, next month we'll have Sydney Duarte learning um, or unlearning mindfulness. Love Sydney. Um, unlearning mindfulness and happiness. Frida Henley. We'll have her on as well, talking about aggression versus assertion. I mean, we have a great lineup coming. So I really appreciate everyone for joining us today, um, just being part of the conversation. So if you know anyone um, or yourself, or you have a great topic that you think um, would be really great for this series, reach out to me. Um, and I would love to talk about it. But um, again, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. And everyone have a good rest of your, uh, your rest of your evening. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Bye, guys. It.